reactive training systems. Welcome to whatever this is. Not sure quite yet if I'm uh, doing a podcast or a YouTube video or whatever, uh, but that's not why you're here. The reason why you're here is presumably because you want to hear how I've managed to overcome my back injuries. And this all got started really today. Uh, I was able to this week finish up my training block with lots of uh, performances that I'm really happy about uh, to include a deadlift rep PR. Uh, I deadlifted 755 pounds for five reps. Never done that before. Um, things are looking really good for my deadlifts. Uh, and maybe, fingers crossed, I'll be able to line up on a deadlift PR at U.S. Nationals here in, you know, a couple of weeks. Maybe you'll know if I got that PR by the time you're listening to this. Um, you'll have to let me know, I guess, right? That's how this works. Anyway, uh, let's talk about like how I got here just so everybody's on the same page. I know that uh, not everybody follows this story super closely. So for some of you that you may have heard this story before, but uh, um, just in the interest of keeping us all on the same page, let's take it from the top. I competed at a high level, uh, was competing at a very high level, competitive internationally, uh, going to the world championships pretty much every year. Um, 2014 was kind of kind of some of my best uh, raw competition. Uh, the world championship that year was a really great performance, if I say so myself. Uh, did really well at the world championship, but in the lead up to that competition, I uh, started to experience some pain in my hip. I didn't realize at the time that it was kind of connected to uh, back pain. It was kind of all tied in together. I uh, didn't realize it right away. Uh, it seemed like a hip issue, right? And so I did what I could to treat it. If you're interested in like this part of the story, uh, I did an Iron Culture uh, podcast a couple years back in 2022. It was right after my comeback competition. And uh, those guys, first of all, run a great podcast. And uh, second of all, we were able to kind of really go through this part of the story uh, with some thoroughness. So uh, if that's your thing, uh, definitely check that out. Um, but it, 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 I guess the upshot is just that it became untenable to continue training, uh, at least in the same way that I had been training up to that point. Um, I would start to ramp up for a competition and then, uh, pain would get worse. Uh, I wasn't able to lock out squats and deadlifts, uh, with any sort of force at all. Like it, it was, uh, really a pain that, uh, peaked as I was locking out either of those movements and, um, you know, tried all kinds of things, hoping to get some relief, you know, from taking time off, various lengths of time off, uh, to different exercises, to different therapies, you know, all the things that desperate athletes try. I did it all in this probably two year period. And as I did, we got gradually closer and closer to a solution. Um, but it was not effective enough, honestly. Uh, so this is like this period of time from 2014 to 2016. And during this period, you know, I'm continuing to train and continuing to compete. And as I would get close to these competitions, the pain would flare up and then the competition would, uh, inevitably go worse. Uh, and the competition I did in 2016 was the worst of all. And it was super disappointing for me, um, like borderline embarrassing. Uh, to go out there. And I mean, everybody's cool. Like everybody always is right. Like the, people understand what coping with an injury is, but still like, it's not 
other people that create the problem. It's, it's our own expectations. It's our, it's ourselves. And that's what was the, the case for me too. You know, I wasn't living up to my own expectations and doing what I was doing up to that point had not been fixing the issue. You know, I still had pain. I still, you know, was, uh, just dealing with it and not able to train effectively. So it was at that point after the 2016 national championship, I decided, you know, that's enough. Like, let's not sign up for another competition. Let's get off of this hamster wheel until I get this thing sorted out. Uh, I'm not going to do anything that hurts. I'm not going to train in a way that provokes pain. I'm just going to get away from painful stuff for a while. And so I did. Uh, I stopped squatting and deadlifting in the competition style. Uh, and I thought, well, I know I want to train. I know I want to get strong. So what do I do in the interim? That's when I got really into doing front squats. Uh, and it's a, maybe another conversation for another day, but I think there's a lot of meat on the bone there. Uh, there's a lot of things that people can value, people can get from that movement uh, if you take the time to develop some proficiency. Um, I maintained you know, my back strength, my upper back strength, and, and all that. I uh, continued to train bench press aggressively. Uh, but that period of time lasted for six years. So it started in 2016. And I didn't compete again until 2022. It didn't have to be that long, but in my case, it was. Uh, as I kind of really got into these other goals and really stepped back from competitive power lifts, uh, I, I liked it. You know, I enjoyed training. It was fun. And I developed goals. And I was still able to connect with powerlifting as a coach. Uh, so. I wasn't really missing that much, or I didn't feel like I was. So I, I was happy, content to chill there for a number of years. And then um, as I kind of realized that my issues had probably resolved uh, and I was able to return to uh, competitive powerlifting, um, then there was the issue of like, how do you, get from point A to point B. So there was this ramping up time and a significant portion of that ramping up time was just figuring out how to ramp up to it. You know, uh, and again, I would refer you to that Iron Culture uh, podcast where we were able to, to go through that period with a lot of detail. Um, what I want to focus on in this particular uh, piece is what comes after that. So I was, long story short is I was eventually able to get myself in shape to do a competition again in March of 2022. I did that competition and went great. Uh, felt healthy, felt good. Uh, later that summer, uh, my family and I moved. We move every couple of years. Um, we moved to a new state and after that, uh, I did have some minor back issues that would pop up. You know, it, it wasn't the same thing as I was dealing with before. It was more stuff that every lifter deals with, you know, acute things that would uh, flare up now and then. And it would flare up and go away, you know, in a week, less than that sometimes, you know. Um, and it wasn't anything that I really considered to be a problem until late in 2022, um, I would get kind of this intermittent pain. It would just, uh, it was definitely a back pain. It was, the pain was located in my back and it would pop up intermittently. Uh, I couldn't reproduce it, uh, except at these random times. And it would be, you know, uh, bending over to tie a shoe, you know, like all the classic things that people talk about. Right. And it would be a really sharp pain and then it would go away. It wasn't directly disruptive to my training, except it kind of made me afraid. You know, it's, it, it, it slows you down. It gives you pause when you think, 
you know, I'm going to descend in the squat and I might just get like a really sharp stabby pain in my back as I come out of it. Like it'll give you a little bit of hesitation. Uh, and that's more or less what I was dealing with, uh, as I uh, kind of went through this period again, this is like late 2022 and, uh, I'm, I'm starting to get ready for, uh, the U S nationals and which would be early 2023. And then, uh, I had a much more, uh, kind of significant event happen as I was about three weeks out from that, if I remember correctly. Um, the same sort of like sharp stabby pain, uh, that I would get intermittently happened during a deadlift training session, but then it didn't go away. You know, it was much worse. And, you know, afterwards you get the back spasm that lots of lifters would be familiar with. And that's what happened to me, you know, and we were three weeks out. I'd been dealing with this for a while and this seemed significant, right? And I thought that the, uh, the competition, uh, was probably out of the window at that point. I thought I'm probably not going to be able to do this competition, probably going to have to withdraw. And I'm grateful that I had good people around me, John Garfano, Susie Hartwig, Gary, uh, who were all like, yeah, maybe, but why don't you just wait and see? Like, I've already booked your plane tickets. You're going there to coach anyway, you know, just keep going, see what you could do. So, I mean, I, I was fortunate that I was uh, able to rehab it aggressively, rehab it quickly, and through no particularly special means, uh, it was a gradual reintroduction program. You know, you, you start, uh, as the pain starts to dissipate, you know, like there, there's this acute phase right after an injury happens where it's super tight and, you know, day-to-day movements are painful. But then in my case, at least that started to subside after a couple of days. And then as that starts to subside, we get back into training, just start doing, you know, body weight movements, just moving around reintroduction. Uh, and then like start loading slowly and gradually ramping that weight back up. In my case, given I was so close to competition, I was ramping it up as quickly as I was comfortable doing like the absolute fastest that I, that I was comfortable doing thinking that, you know, there's a chance that I'll provoke this injury again, but if I don't do it this way, then there's no chance of me, you know, feeling comfortable stepping on the platform. And I want to point out that I was lucky that I didn't provoke the injury. You know, I've, I've worked with a lot of people who've had uh, similar issues and we ramp them, you know, do the reintroduction process at various speeds. And sometimes it works and sometimes, you know, it, we get hit with a recurrence. It's just a signal that, Hey, you got to slow this thing down a little bit. Usually. And, uh, you maybe need to look for some other contributors and maybe get some other professionals involved and, and things like that. I'm very fortunate that at this point, I didn't really have that. You know, I was able to pretty simply, pretty aggressively ramp back up and not have any sort of recurrence or anything like that. Uh, and you know, if you look back at the, uh, things that I posted shortly after, uh, us nationals in, uh, 2023, you know, you'll note that I was just happy, uh, to have been able to compete. I ended up coming second and I said, I'd never been so happy with a second place finish, uh, in all my life. And that's true. Yeah. So I, I did this competition and was able to kind of sneak one through, but still like I, I could see that I, I'd come back to competing. And then within a year I had gone from, you know, really not having any sort of symptoms, no pain issues or anything like that to pretty frequently, frequently, more frequently than I was comfortable having things pop up, having pain issues, having minor injuries. Sometimes it would resolve quickly, sometimes more significantly. I didn't like how that was headed. Um, I didn't know at this point uh, if I would ever get back to, uh, you know, personal best levels of strength, you know, something I, I shared a little bit 
at the time with kind of where my mentality was at during this period wasn't good. You know, I mean, I had been dealing with this has been such a long road so long since my last, you know, personal bests in competition, squatting or deadlifting, you know, and then as I was starting to get closer to those levels again, uh, I would start to see pain again. And, you know, I'm thinking like, maybe, maybe I'm just kind of past all of this, you know, maybe my best days are behind me uh, in terms of one RM strength in the competitive power lifts, which is like, let's be fair. Let's have a little perspective. That's a pretty narrow uh, view of things, but um, sometimes there in the midst of injury, like that's, that's what you got. And that's what I had at the time, you know, like the reality of it is I was kind of questioning whether or not I would be able to come back from this. And still you've got to try. I felt like felt compelled to try. So I did. And trying the same strategy again, just hoping that it would go better the second time or the 25th time or whatever this was, uh, didn't seem to be too bright. So I knew that I wanted to do something different and I'd had an idea rattling around in my head, right? Now this, now we're getting, if you're wondering, we're getting into the, the, really the crux, the meat of, of probably why you're here, why you're watching this video to begin with. The idea bouncing around in my head was really an idea around load management. When we look at injury management in powerlifting and sports in general, it seems to be injuries are provoked uh, by uh, mismanaged loading uh, and the strategy for return to training, return to play, return to whatever is uh, a load management strategy. When I talk about gradual reintroduction, that's a load management strategy. That's what I had done with other injuries for years and years. And it wasn't just me, you know, this is an idea as old as strength training itself. It wasn't really sufficient at this point. And I didn't have a lot of belief that, you know, doing some sort of movement screen or, you know, more stretching or more stability exercises or anything like that. I didn't really feel confident that that was the ticket, you know, and we'll come back to that aspect again, uh, in a little bit, but it, I really kind of latched on to this idea of load management. And I thought, you know, I can take this idea further. Uh, what happens if I, you know, take the idea of load management as kind of as far as I can, you know, can I do a better job of managing my training loads and not provoke these types of injuries? Long, long ago, back at the beginning of all this, I had identified that the mechanic that was associated with uh, pain for me is something I've just kind of come to call spinal shear because it's essentially a shearing load uh, on my back. Anything that puts me in like a forward leaned position represents a, a, how do I put it? That's the position that has the potential to be painful. In the beginning, it was, we're talking about things like good mornings, things like competition squatting, low bar squatting, deadlifting, you know, the more upright I could be, the more, the, the less shearing load I could have on my back and the more compressive load I could turn it into. Uh, the better off I would be. That's why front squats were a good option. That's why hack squats never bothered me. Sumo deadlifting wasn't great, but it was better than conventional deadlifting. I'm just a terrible sumo deadlifter. So I knew that spinal shear was kind of the thing. And that was the thing that I wanted to manage. And at this point, let me lay out a little bit more of the, uh, the context of how I'm managing training at this point. I'm, it, it's essential to understand that a, a feature, an indispensable feature really of all this is the stress index. And this is going to sound like in the weeds, it's going to sound like, um, you know, focusing on these tiny details and how could that possibly make a difference? But it really does. Having the right metric is crucial. 
And for me, I think stress index is the metric that makes the most sense for load management. Uh, you can think of stress index as number of hard sets, but easy sets aren't zero. You know, Greg Knuckles uh, on Stronger by Science has a great article from years ago uh, that kind of turned the industry really toward thinking about volume as number of hard sets. And I think that's a really great way to frame it. It's just that different levels of difficulty, you know, count differently, you know. And, you know, we could, we've done lessons before on like, what is the stress index? How is it calculated? Where does it come from? And all that stuff. I don't know that that's super important to get into right now. Um, but the, the thing that's worth remembering is just that, uh, stress index in terms of the number, you can think of it like number of hard sets, but it could also be a greater number of easy sets, you know? So. Uh, if you did three sets that were all nine RPE, uh, that may be the equivalent stress of, um, five or six sets at like a six RPE, you know? Um, and I mean, there's more to it than that. Like the intensity matters, uh, the precise RPE matters. Uh, and these days the calculation of the stress index has been refined quite a lot and we have gone to lots of pains to update this model. I think we're on version five or so now. Um, and you know, this is something that we revisit pretty regularly, uh, to make sure that it's, uh, modeling things as accurately as we can. Um, the way that we do this calculation allows us to like break the stress index down into these two component metrics we just roughly call central and peripheral stress. And, and some people may want to quibble over that terminology. The terminology is not the important thing. The important thing to note is that what we call central stress is moved more by the intensity. You know, how many sets at a given intensity, uh, higher intensity sets count as more, uh, lower intensity sets count as less. That's central stress. Peripheral stress doesn't really work like that. Peripheral stress uh, takes the RPE into account to a greater extent. And then you can combine these things together to form a total stress picture. The reason that I bring that up is like having that capability was really important to me as I moved into this management system. So what I looked to do at this point was to build a database uh, with all these exercises that I do in training and try to come up with some sort of quantification for whether they produced a significant spinal shear or not, uh, or was it kind of some gray area in the middle and then look at the stress index of spinal shear movements, generally speaking. From there, we kind of do acute to chronic work ratio. So if you're familiar, if you're not familiar with acute to chronic work ratio, it's just, it's a pretty simple idea. It's something that a lot of people do intuitively. They just maybe don't know the term for it. You have a certain amount of work that you're used to. This is your chronic workload. Um, lots of times people will think of it as, you know, your four week average workload. There's no reason it has to be four weeks. Uh, it could be three weeks, it could be six weeks, it could be eight weeks, it could be whatever number you pick. Uh, it's fairly arbitrary. Uh, and I think what I would say is I look at uh, uh, several different timeframes for all these, but uh, it's important to look at what your chronic workload is. And then your acute workload should fall within a range, you know, um, Generally speaking, I would kind of set that range as like 80% to 120, 130%, maybe a bit higher than that even. Um, and then where exactly in the range would be based on my recovery. So what I'm presenting here is kind of a complicated system. I understand that this is a system that has grown up with me 
for years and years at this point. Uh, and it would be difficult for me to convey it to you with a lot of simplicity, but that's not my point. My point is just to convey it to you. So hopefully it'll give you some ideas and I'll get into maybe what a less mathy approach would be here in a few minutes. Uh, but essentially what I'm doing is I'm finding this range uh, and basing my acute workload, you know, today's workload off of the chronic workload and trying to make sure that I keep the acute within a range of the chronic workload. So if I want to increase how much spinal shear I can tolerate, I need to do that in a gradual way, in a controlled way, over a sustained period of time. That makes sense, right? The thing is, it can be tricky to actually do. And then, by the way, your body is always responding and adapting. Uh, things come up, outside stressors come up. And I wanted the systems that I've uh, built up to be responsive to that sort of thing. So I may have a target, uh, uh, you know, of let's say it's 120%. So I'm trying to get my acute workload to be around 120% of the baseline workload. That's all well and good. But if I start having soreness, if I start having excessive stiffness, uh, if other factors around my recovery are not lining up, then that 120% target starts to look more and more like a bad idea. So in my system, I will bring that number down, or the system rather will bring that number down. And it may even go below the baseline workload. It may go, you know, it down to maybe 80%. So really, it's kind of a built-in deload, if you want to put it that way, or a built-in uh, maintenance uh, training load. When recovery is looking difficult, then it will bring down that target workload. Uh, and that's been really helpful as well. Now, the way this plays out in real life, in real life training, is that I may go to the gym today, let's say today's squat day. And squat definitely has a spinal shear component. And I'm already carrying some spinal shear stress from past training sessions. So I'm looking at these numbers that are all, you know, being calculated, uh, in, in the system that I've got. And it'll tell me, uh, something along the lines of, you know, you've got one SI, uh, available for spinal shear today. Uh, you know, recall that one SI is like one hard set, right? So depending on how hard the protocols are, it may be one set, it may be two working sets. Um, but regardless, when I have reached that limit uh, of spinal shear stress that I've decided to, to allow, then I'll move on to something else. And it could be the case that the muscles of my legs or whatever uh, have not been sufficiently trained. They may need more training load, but I've kind of reached the limit, uh, for what, for what spinal shear, uh, is available. So I may only do those one or two working sets of squats and then move on to something else like belt squats or leg press or single leg work or whatever, uh, to continue, you know, giving the muscles the work that they need, but doing it in a way that won't provoke the injury. Uh, but then over time, recovery allowing, that baseline workload should go up and I'll be able to tolerate more work. And over the last year, I've definitely seen that. It's a slow process. Uh, it's a deliberate process. It gets better when I pay attention to it. And, you know, I do blocks focused on development of work capacity and things like that. Um, which again, maybe that's another topic for another day. But through paying attention to it, I'm able to improve it. That's kind of the gross training load management that has been uh, super helpful uh, and probably the the main difference maker in this last year. Uh, probably that's probably the main thing that's allowed me to 
you know, really go this last year without any sort of back injury. Now, I do say back injury, meaning, I, you know, I haven't lost any training time uh, due to, you know, any sort of flare up or anything like that. I've had some days where, you know, I get some stiffness or something doesn't feel quite right, but it resolves very quickly. Uh, and, you know, again, we'll talk about these acute uh, techniques in, in just a second. The management of that spinal shear overall workload has probably been the biggest factor in allowing that to happen. I've also noticed that managing the intensity increase as you come into competition is really important too. Uh, allowing the intensity to go up, but not too fast. Uh, this is where the distinction between central and peripheral stress can come into play really nicely. Uh, central stress being more responsive to intensity, you can do the same types of calculations. You can look at your central stress baseline scores, your central stress uh, acute scores, and manage those things directly as well so that you're not raising central stress too quickly. And uh, that also has been really important to not beating me up quite so much as I come into a competition. So this has been my approach. You know, obviously this approach is really math heavy and I understand how it may be difficult for the average listener to listen to me talk about this and come away with an action plan. I get that. There's really no way around that. It's, it, it's not a system that I can effectively convey with words, but that's why we build systems, right? That they help guide our decisions without needing to explain it all uh, every time. There are other approaches, though. Uh, there are less mathy approaches, more intuitive approaches, but it all gets back to the same thing and understanding what your baseline workload is, a willingness to be responsive in your training uh, to your own recovery levels, you know, identifying what sorts of mechanisms provoke the injury, and you know, just being sensible about that, being uh, attentive to it, but not scared of it. You know, um, there was a video that we put on the RTS uh, YouTube channel recently where Ross uh, and I, the, another RTS coach, Ross Lepola, and I talk about this very thing because he and I have kind of had similar sorts of uh, strategies be effective, where my approach is very math heavy. His approach is a lot more intuitive uh, and reliant on his own observations in the moment. Um, I tend to prefer the, the math heavy approach because I want to make sure that I'm not giving in too easily uh, to my feelings in the moment or something along those lines. Uh, I want to validate um, those feelings, um, make sure that I'm not being too lazy or being too aggressive. It's not that the math tells me what to do. I always tell my clients, don't let spreadsheets tell you to do something stupid. It's that I will have a preference, you know, like maybe my back doesn't feel quite right. Uh, and then I look at the numbers. Oh, actually, uh, my spinal shear is already above the baseline number. So maybe you should pull it back. You've already got the training stress that you need. Let's pull it back. It's not worth the risk. You know, uh, it's been a very nice sanity check. Uh, it's been a way to, you know, make sure that I'm not leaning too much into my own feelings or not, not that go, I guess it is leaning too much in my own feelings, but it just kind of goes both directions. It could be, you know, timidness and kind of pulling things back too quickly. Uh, but it can also just as easily be too aggressive. You know, I watched the chef field recently and it gets the blood boiling and you want to go train and it's easy to write that training program thinking like, yeah, we need to, uh, you need to push some more training volume or something like that, but that may not be the responsible choice. And it's good to have some sort of a mechanism that, that kind of points that out to you like, oh, hey, this workload is way above your baseline. You know, it may be worth paying attention to and tempering that a little bit. I wanted to touch briefly on some of the acute management tools. You know, I mentioned that I'll have a little bit of uh, minor discomfort now and then, really. 
um, it's not enough for me to be concerned about. It hasn't been enough for me to, you know, make any further modifications in my training or anything like that. But, um, working with, uh, Dr. Nathan Daly was instrumental in that. And I've worked with him for a couple of years. He really got me out of a jam, uh, when I was training for nationals in 2023, I, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'd gotten injured in the, the three weeks prior to that competition. He was pivotal in helping me uh, get back into condition for that competition. Uh, you know, we talked, he showed me some things uh, to do, some, wouldn't even necessarily call them stretches. They're exercises of a kind, I guess. Uh, it's physical therapy. Uh, but pardon my, uh, my bumbling here, uh, Dr. Nathan, if you're listening to this, but it's the, the exercises that he showed me how to do were immediately beneficial in, uh, my pain levels at the, in the moment. You know, I remember not being able to take a full, sh full length stride without having some pain issues at the time. And we do some exercises and then I can walk normally. Uh, things like that were really helpful in those acute phases. And we continued to work together throughout that whole, uh, run up. And even in, in the weeks after the competition was over, uh, just to kind of make sure that things were normal. And I keep all those exercises in my back pocket. And occasionally, you know, I'll have, uh, I'll have some reason to do some prone press ups or, uh, something else, you know, people may want to argue whether that, you know, is really helpful or whether it fixes things or, or not. And look, sometimes those conversations are interesting and useful to have, but the bottom line is, uh, there are specific cases when it is acutely helpful and in my opinion, that's worth doing by itself. Now, of course, it's worth stating that we don't want to overcommit to any of those narratives and uh, being careful around those narratives is also worth doing. Yes, that's all true. For a lot of people in my position, for too long, really, it was easy to throw the baby out with the bathwater and, you know, kind of get caught up into the well, these things, these things don't really do anything anyway. So why am I wasting my time on it? Well, it does something, you know, it maybe isn't the magic bullet that we wish it was, um, but you know, it's doing something and having somebody in your corner that can help you with that acute management, uh, is, has been really, really important and really, really helpful. And to that end, like I would put general core stability exercises and things like that into that bucket as well. You know, I still do my McGill big three, uh, type of thing now and then I don't, uh, I don't do it religiously, but I gotta tell you, you know, I do feel better when I'm doing it consistently. And again, I think having a stronger midsection is probably not a bad thing, you know? Again, be careful about the narratives that you tell around all that stuff, but hopefully these are all pretty uh, benign statements that we can all agree on. But, you know, this has been kind of the path that it's taken for me. Uh, and this is what, you know, my training has looked like. This is what the, the management of that training load has looked like. And, and, you know, I'm glad that I can sit here and tell you guys that I've got it all figured out. Well, I mean, that's a joke. Of course, I don't have it all figured. Um, I fully expect that what I've got here is a system that's helped me get to this point and hopefully a bit further down the road. For sure, I will run into another bottleneck uh, and there will be more problems that need to be solved, tweaks to systems that need to be made, whether that's more accurate modeling of these things. Um, I don't know. I don't know what comes next. Um, but you know, knock on wood that this system is as effective as I believe that it is. Uh, I do believe that it has been effective. I think this has been pretty instrumental. Um, it, like I said, it's been more than a year now, uh, without a 
an acute event happening that's been disruptive to my training, which, you know, really hasn't happened. If you, if you look at the data, um, if I'm training squats and deadlifts with any kind of intensity and regularity, hasn't happened since like 2014. So, you know, I tell people that I'm the last few competitions I've gone into, I've felt healthier than I have in years, maybe ever. Uh, and it's been, it's been overall good. And I continue to develop and refine that system. So this has been quite the monologue and I hope that you found it to be useful and that you get something out of it that, uh, helps you in your own training. And as always, just thanks for watching. Thanks for listening and we'll see you next time.